Um, I'll, I'll sort of get us started and I'm gonna hand it over to Maria and Erika. Um, I'll introduce Maria and Erika. They're uh, researchers from Argentina and I'll have uh, them tell them uh, tell you guys a little bit about themselves as well. But um, again, I just wanna thank you two so much for taking the time with our group. Um, that's, it's really such a big deal. And I, I think I might be wrong, somebody can correct me, but I think this is the first uh, international presentation that our group has ever had. So um, that's kind of big. And um, I, you know, everybody knows I'm a big fan of tortoises. So, um, and I love what you guys do down there. So I'm really excited to um, hear you guys talk about it and for everybody else to hear it as well. Um, so, and uh, oh, I'll also remind everybody again to, um, during the presentation to mute yourselves. And so I'll hand it over to Maria and Erika and you can, I believe, screen share whenever you're ready. And if you have any issues or questions, let me know, or um, I'll be here to field any questions. Um, there's also a, uh, a chat room, a chat box that if uh, people can throw questions into. And uh, when we wrap up, we'll do our best with uh, questions and things. Um, after the presentation. Does that work for okay. you guys? Right. Okay, sure. great. Okay, why not? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can you see my uh, presentation? Yes? Yeah, we can right. see it, thank you. Okay. Uh, well, I'm uh, Maria Eugenia Echave, and my partner is Erika Kubisch. Um, uh, well, first of all, we would like to thank all of you for this proposal. We are, uh, I am very nervous, <laughs> but very happy also because, well, you will be able to meet our beautiful Chaco tortoise and some parts of the work that we are going, we are doing here in the, in Argentina. Uh, I need to tell you that my English is not very good. So um, I hope you can understand uh, and have a little patience. <coughs> the talk is about the life history and conservation of the Chaco tortoise in Rio Negro's province that's in the north of uh, Patagonia. Um, let's see oops. what happened here. Okay, this is our tortoise. It's called uh, Kelanoidis chilensis. Uh, this is species. Is the species uh, is the land tortoise with the southernmost distribution in the world. Uh, here is the distribution, this orange uh, patch. Uh, it's uh, in the Monte and Chaco of Argentina, south of Bolivia and Paraguay. Here, geographically, you can see that uh, it's very near, near the, these other species that are uh, Kelonoidis carbonaria and Kelonoidis um, denticulatus, but genetically it's more close uh, related to the giant tortoises from the Galapagos. Uh, they have uh, a big difference with the giant tortoises because these are very small ones. Uh, and the females here are much bigger than the males. That's another uh, difference. Dimorphism that you can see that only in adults. Uh, here you can see the males uh, have the ventral part concave and not the females. They are herb uh, herbivores, herbivorous. <laughs> But sometimes they eat insects and other invertebrates, especially when they are juveniles. Uh, this species has um, two marked 
periods, one of activity and the other one uh, of inactivity. This one uh, is in the cold season. They usually make some burrows uh, between, uh, usually between thorny bushes uh, for protection. And, and the other, um, there they sleep all the winter. The other period is uh, the period of activity, but it's in the warm uh, month, month where they uh, just stay in simple caves, very shallow, or just under bushes. They usually uh, lay between three and seven eggs, most of the times uh, four, and they can uh, have up to three clutches in the season. And here the season is between January to March. They uh, dig very uh, simple nest with their uh, hin legs and until they make a hole deep enough, but no more than 15 centimeters. Um, usually the nests are in open spaces uh, where the eggs can have the heat of the sun. And well, this is obviously a, a big problem uh, because of the predation and the trampling uh, to which they are exposed. Um, the incubation in this species is the longest in the world, especially in the population we are working with, um, almost 18 months. 18 months. Almost 18 months um, because of the low temperatures uh, of uh, the place. Well, uh, this species uh, is considered vulnerable by the red, in the red list by the IUCN because it has many threats. Well, the principal one is the loss of the habitat by agriculture as many other species. Um, and the other one is the mascotism. Uh, in Argentina, it's very common to have uh, tortoises as pets. And this species is the most illegally trained reptile species. Um, be and because of that, it's also, also in the appendix two of the CITES. And uh, well, uh, we didn't found, well, there is not too much uh, information about this species. So uh, with Erika, we decided to start uh, studying this species. So we are working since 2017 in two sites uh, near San Antonio Oeste, this is my, my town. Uh, we are studying here. This is the north of the Patagonia, mm. in, the, in the south of Argentina. Our two sites of study are the one with cattle management and the other without cattle management. For uh looking for uh for our tortoises we usually uh, make some transects uh, we use the roads at, as transects um so we go by vehicle at very slow speed and during uh the tortoises peak season that's uh, between september to march uh, and we have another uh, active search too, that's uh, just by walking, sometimes in transit, sometimes not. Um, and we find not only, we look not only for tortoises, but also for trails or different signs 
as barrels or eggshells or scats. And here you can see in this photo uh, how is the environment. It's not at the, at the desert, as you can see. Uh, we have many, many bush, bushes and grasses, so it's not very easy to find them, especially because they are sometimes in the burrows or behind the, the bushes. When we find a tortoise, uh, we take a lot of measurements and data as temperature, you know, the coordinates, um, the weight, <coughs> and we try to see the behavior, the state of health, and we uh, identify them, each one, uh, by marking in, um, in the plates, in the carapace. Mm -hmm. Here, we have a special code and we put a special number for each one. And sometimes if we can, we take some blood, urine and feces sample, but not always because um, we usually don't, don't want to stress them. Um, we are starting to uh, work with some radio transmitters and we are developing a special device with some engineers and physics. Um, this is to learn more about the ecology of, the, of this species and especially as uh, home range and activity periods and a lot of other stuff. Um, this device has uh, different sensors and we are very excited about that because uh, we know we are going to obtain uh, many useful data and it's very promising for us. But we are still working in the device. We just uh, tried a couple of times. We hope this, um, this season we can uh, make some, some other um, research with, with that. Well, our preliminary results, um, well, we made 18 field trips already. That means like almost 100 days of uh, field, but we only find uh, 182 specimens. And from those only 60 were recaptured at least once. Why is that? Uh, we found very few individuals because we realized that has many, many threats. One of the worst is the white boar uh, because not only it's the juveniles and immatures, but also the adults and they can smell the nests. So it's a very big issue for us. Uh, other one are the, the wild dogs that are usually near the road. We saw, we see, we usually see uh, many of um, teeth marks in the shells and amputations. Another issue is the, the cattle. <coughs> uh, we know in uh, this species. We um, don't know uh, really how, but uh, here you can see in a place with uh, cattle management, we only find uh, one juvenile. This is the other place without cattle. We found not a lot, but we find much more. Um, well, we don't know really if this is for, because of the trampling of the nest, the, some competition with, uh, for herbivory, but because of that, 
I just applied uh, for a scholarship. Uh, and my PhD project is uh, about this issue. It's the effects of the cattle in the viability of the, of the population. So we hope in, a, in very few years, we can know what is happening here. Uh, well, other threats are the roads. And well, this photo is, uh, is in a place that we used to work and has no cattle, at least uh, uh, now. Uh, and once we, we reached there, one time we reached there and we saw this, <laughs> it was very sad uh, because it was a big place, all mowed. And, and there we found four tortoises dead. So um, unfortunately, this is very, common in the ranches and, and it's very sad we, we can't do anything about that. And well, the fires, that happens uh, all the season. And we have an extra one <laughs> that is the water canal that brings uh, water uh, to the city. It's, a, it's, a, it's open and it has almost 180 kilometers long. This place, uh, it's uh, terrible because not only for tortoises, but for all the native species that uh, want to bring water and drown there. As here. Uh, well, now it's worse because in some places they are replacement, replacing the cement for this plastic membrane that it's very slippery, so it's really in, uh, impossible to escape for anyone. Uh, well, at first, uh, we just wanted to do some research and to know a little bit more about these species, but we realized that has many, many threats. And so we, we decided to um, start working, working uh, with uh, education and divulgation too. So uh, we start to work with some ranchers, with teachers, with researchers, with decision makers from the government and from and with non-profit organizations. But, well, our biggest issue is that we are only two people <laughs> uh, and with very few resources. So uh, we try to do our best, but uh, it's too much for only the two of us. So um, we have been uh, doing a lot of things. One of those are, um, well, we made some t-shirts to sell and to get some funds. And, <coughs> and we, are going, we are trying to get some new volunteers as max. <laughs> uh, and well, um, we have also uh, our Facebook uh, uh, page here. Uh, where everyone that has any concern or want to share with us some information or whatever they can um, they can talk to us and well <laughs> uh, in uh, that that's all um, to for us uh, it, it's very short I know but uh, we hope you have many questions for Erika, especially. <laughs> I talk too much. <laughs> um, Maria, thank you so much. That was really no, great. No, thank you yes. for <laughs> thank you, thank all of you for hearing us, and I hope this uh, this is useful for you and. 
And I hope uh, many of you came here to help us. We have a lot of work, as you have seen. <laughs> okay. We need to go. Yes. <laughs> um, great. Well, um, I'll ask you, you can uh, close your screen share and I'll let the sure. uh, let uh, anybody with questions uh, come on. You can put uh, questions in the chat if you like, or um, oh. there's just a small amount of us here. So I know I, I know I have a couple. And in general, I'm just blown away by this by this animal. I love the a uh, few of the facts that you put out, and one being that it's the southernmost tortoise in the world, um, and the 18, 18 month incubation. That's that's just uh, unbelievable to me. So, uh -huh. um, and I guess the the other thing that I find most interesting about this species is is. Uh, is how, in some ways, how similar it is to our North American uh, gopher tortoises and desert tortoises. Um, and in some ways, the landscape and, and climate are similar. And I just think that's, that's just so neat that we can be, you know, almost a half a world away, but st still share so many uh, similarities. Mm -hmm. um, I think I saw a question uh, jump into the chat. Um, Bill wanted to know if that was creosote that he saw in the in the background there. Was that right, Bill? Oh, well, you're you're muted, Bill. A lot of those pictures almost look like they could be my property. <laughs> yes. And I know and I know creosote grows in South America too. And I was wondering if it's the same species as what I've got here. The uh, labia. I don't know if it's the same species. The, the one we have here is Laria tridentata. No, here is, uh, we have uh, four species of Larrea, but yes, uh, I saw the Larrea tridentata there. No, it's uh, very similar, but not the same species. Okay. Yeah, that's great. And there are, there are cactus too, right? Yes. And rattlesnakes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like home. Yeah, I mean that that feels like home to me until until the uh, uh, armadillo appears, I guess. Uh, we have another question um, from John. It says, "How far apart do the females uh, make their nests? How far apart?" Yes. Um, so you said they do three clutches. Do they separate the nests by large distances? Well, we we don't really know that. Uh, for sure. We know uh, more of that issue because of the, the pets, of the tortoises that are pets. Because in the nature, the first nest that was found, uh, we found it last summer but because of the radio transmitters, but we don't know uh, more information about that. Mm. Yeah, that's tough information to gather, I guess. You mentioned also that the females are larger than males. This is different than a lot of uh, tortoise species. Um, and normally they they say that the, you know, in the case that where a, a male is larger than the female, it's usually because there's a combat competition between the males. Um, do the male torto uh, chocolate tortoises combat or fight or um, challenge each other over females? Yes, a lot. Uh -huh. A lot. Yes, yes. And uh, we have, uh, we know, uh, we have seen uh, many of those combats in the nature, mm -hmm. but we know that uh, in the gardens, uh, when they are pets, they usually kill uh, uh, each other uh, kill yes each other in in, in um, when they are two males together. Oh, I see. It's very. Eddie. I see. Oh. Um. Interesting. Oh, and then the you mentioned the aqueduct and the sort of risk that that poses to tortoises, but also other wildlife and. I'm sure folks are interested in some of the other wildlife because of course you guys have such an interesting um, diversity of species. Um, 
I think one that maybe some folks might be interested in are the armadillos. Yes, armadillos, guanacos, uh, choikes, all the native native uh, animals from here, uh, um, falls, falls and drown there. Yes, it's sad. How yes. many species of armadillos are there in that uh, region? Erika, puedes hablar? <laughs> <laughs> Where is Erika? Um, two, I think two. Uh, uh, armadillo. Here? Ahí en la zona, dos. Is one of them the little pink one? The big pink? one, el peludo. Uh -huh. Not the biggest, but we have a big one that is hairy. It has mm -hmm. like hair and one smaller. But in the, in the country, there are more species. There are more. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those are so interesting to me. They uh, just seem like such an unusual animal. Um, well, uh, are there um, any other questions out there? Are there are there other ways that we can help your organization or get the word out? Um, I'll ask folks. So you put up your um, uh, Facebook page, so I'll ask folks to look for that. Oh, it looks like we had one more question pop up. Um, let's see here. Oh gosh, I forgot how to do that. Um, where is the, oh, there's the chat. Gosh, I'm sorry. Uh, Brandon wanted to know, are there any XC2 conservation efforts underway? Like, um, uh, the 18 month incubation seems like a challenge for captive breeding. I think maybe Brandon's asking about, are there any um, breeding programs in zoos or other facilities around the world or in Argentina that you know of? Eddie, vos conoces más sobre el tema. Yes, uh, oh, sorry, uh, I, my English is not very good. <laughs> Uh, no, there aren't uh, any programs, uh, legal programs, but there are uh, a lot of people in the house, uh, pet uh, collectionistas, how do you say? Uh, Collectors. That, like, uh, like a pet uh, that people uh, uh, breed in the house, uh, but uh, only for pets. And that is very sad because it's difficult because there are a lot of... Uh, animals in captivity, uh, and it's a problem. But uh, it's, uh, there aren't a legal uh, program. Mm -hmm. And the, the 18 months, so the, the eggs must overwinter then. Like they spend, the eggs yes. spend a winter underground and then maybe hatch in the spring? Mm -hmm. Yes. That, that is in the southernmost population. Uh -huh. Maybe in the north, uh, the, the incubation period is uh, shorter. Shorter. Um, uh, in, the, in captivity too. In captivity, maybe in four, three, four, four months, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's okay, depending on temperature. Um, but in, in, the, in our places, uh, the winter is very cold. And I think that the embryos have uh, the metabolism uh, slow and don't grow. I don't know. So, um, uh, but I, I guess relative to that, it, it would seem like there'd be a lot of egg failure for such a long incubation period. So is there is is the hatch rate? Do are there more successful hatchlings in those clutches or less? in the southern portion where it's colder. So if the female lays four eggs in each clutch, do four of them hatch in the southern region where it's cold or do only one or two of them hatch? Well, we don't know uh, enough about that. Um, this uh, nest, uh, I told you, we, we found uh, in summer, because we uh, follow the female, we, we saw the female at first that ha uh, has been uh, ha um, digging, mm -hmm. and we, are, uh, we realized 
she was uh, going to lay eggs. So we, um, we follow her for three or for three, three, days, yeah, three days. And we saw them putting the, uh, laying the eggs. So um, we went to the place and ¿cómo se dice? Eh, protegimos. We protect the nest the best we could. Uh, but some days ago, we realized that uh, it has been um, pre predate, predate? Armadillo, I think. Predated, yes. yes. By, uh, I think by an armadillo. armadillo, maybe. So uh, we, we know that's much more common than, than uh, we thought. And it's very difficult to, to um, reach to the uh, nest to see them. And we are not uh, seeing too many juveniles. So we think the situation is uh, much worse than we thought. Um, mm. We don't have enough information anyway. Sure. What, what is the lifespan of a tortoise when it reaches, a, say it reaches adulthood? How long do they live? I don't know. Pero más o menos. Sí. No, in captivity, I know some people that have one tortoises of uh, 1990, 90 years, 90 90. years. But uh, in captivity and uh, in, in nature, we don't know really. ¿Y cuánto tiempo tardan en ser, en, en poder procrear? Madurez sexual, maybe um, 15 years. In, in captivity, maybe few years. Thirty, no, thirty, no, fifty, thirty. Thirty or so. so. So they have to live at least fifteen years to start to lay eggs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Not very easy for this species. <laughs> That's hard. Oh, so interesting. <laughs> it's, it's so interesting. Also, that you mentioned. Their nearest relation is the Galapagos tortoise. Mm -hmm. Is it thought maybe that uh, yeah. a common ancestor tortoise was the first tortoise to make its way to Galapagos and evolve into the Galapagos tortoise? Or has the Galapagos tortoise evolved directly from something very similar to the Chaco tortoise? Eri, ¿entendiste? Eh, ¿Me puedes traducir? Está preguntando uh, sobre el antecesor del... De ah, ¿Está la diapositiva? Sí. I think that the... Um, oh, I don't remember the, no. the word. Um, no. But um, the, I think that is in the south. And then... Creo, ¿Vos me traducís? ¿Lo hablo en castellano, <laughs> Maru? <laughs> En la diapositiva que mostraste es el trabajo eh, que explica el origen y el antecesor que tienen en común, eh, creo que era del sur, tenía una amplia distribución y después fueron a las islas. No sé si esa es la pregunta. So, si did you understand ma más? Uh, the antecesor, uh, what? Just a little. Ok, the antecesor was from the south and has a very uh, big distribution. And then uh, they went to the Galapagos. Oh, so it was from the continent at first with a big distribution and then migrate. Fascinating. Um, well, okay, thank you. Um, are there any more uh, questions out there? I'll check our our chat box here to be sure. Okay, well, it looks like that's, uh, well, anyways, I just think uh, your, what you, the work you guys do there is uh, really great. Yeah, and Bill says, thank you. Um, I'm just, I just think it looks like so much fun and such a great project and such an important one. And um, I hope to, you know, I hope that you guys learned so much more. Oh, I had, I just uh, thought of my last question. I'm sorry. 
one more question. <laughs> Are, are they active yet? You in your in your slides you mentioned September was the start of the season. Is it? Yes. Almost, yeah. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> Spring time already. Uh, not already, but we have uh, we had many good days, very warm days uh, these last two weeks. And Erika was here last week, and she find uh, she found. Uh, uh, two or three, three, yes, they then were already the wake up. Fascinating! Wow. And the the winters are 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 cold there. Are they? Is there any activity in the winter, or they they are definitely underground all winter? No, they are uh, most of the time underground. Mm -hmm. um, they don't make um the burrows as the, um as big as in the desert mm -hmm. <coughs> they are very shallow here but uh, they are usually uh sleeping on the winter and in this time it's not very common for them to be awake but with uh, some good days they they wake up and they just uh, walk a little bit. Sometimes they drink water if there is, and and then they uh, keep sleeping for a few days more. And they start. They are starting just right now to, to wake. Mm -hmm. They are Every not in the activity period, uh, but almost. I see. Everything happens a little bit more slowly with a tortoise, I think. Mm -hmm. Even waking up from the winter is slow. I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned there. Um, but here they don't, they don't, uh, in the summer as the gopherus, for example, mm -hmm. they are awake all the, all the warm season. I see. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, you two. I really, really appreciate you guys taking the time. You really, Maria, you did excellent. Um, I know that must be very hard with a language difference. And I, I'm so sorry my Spanish isn't better, but um, I came, came through great for me. I think everybody else probably uh, agrees with me. And um, Erika, I really appreciate you guys taking the time with us. Uh, I know it's very late there, so we won't keep you guys um, any longer than you wish to stay. Um, in this portion, after our presentations, we'll go into a little bit of uh, our uh, business meetings and things for our, for our little group, but um, it was really so nice to see you too, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, we'll stay in contact and uh, you can join our group. We're on Zoom now, so you can join our New Mexico Herpetological Society for future meetings. Right. We have a lot of great speakers, and you guys are a great example of that. Um, it's a lot of fun to see and to now with Zoom to be able to reach out to uh, folks from all over the world. So um, thank you so much, and uh, thanks for being the first uh, international presentation ever for the New Mexico Herpetological thank Society. Thank you.